Dear students, welcome to the tutorial number two of the course Decision Support and Uncertainty. Uh, today we have uh, three exercises. In first two rather um, theoretical exercises, we will concentrate or we will continue the discussion of linear optimization. And in the last third exercise, which will take some time, we will uh, discuss decision making models or uncertainty and certainty uh, situations. So it will be not optimization, but slightly different uh, approach. Now we can uh, start from exercise one. I will turn off the webcam. So we have more um, state space on the screen. And in the first question you are asked uh, about linearity. So you are asked which of these, or maybe all of them, or none of them, three uh, optimization models which you are given are linear or not linear and why. First of all, to answer this question, we need to understand what is linearity. I guess you studied it before in your studies or even uh, at school. But let's go to the first lecture and we have this definition. So first of all, we have the definition of linear program. And according to this definition, we are asked to maximize or minimize some objective linear function. So linear. And to the subject regarding the linear constraints, again, the linear. We have some general sum notation of the abstract model. And then, uh, so we have here word linear two times. So what is exact, exactly linear? And on the next slide, we have, it's not a definition of linear. It's just the list of requirements that the model, the problem should satisfy to be linear. So uh, the first requirement is that all the um, decision variables can have exponent of one. So for example, uh, here we have non-linear expressions and decision variable x, it has the exponent of two. So it's uh, non-linear. Then uh, products of decision variables are not allowed. So we cannot multiply two decision variables. Like here you see x1 is multiplied by x2. Basically, first and second rule, they are the same. Just here we multiply decision variable by itself. And here we multiply two decision variables. And then uh, here we are the third requirement. It's that all functions are continuous and differentiable. So uh, what that mean? Uh, basically, it means that if you would depict expression or function, you could depict it as uh, one line and not as the some line which stops if what it says here kinks or leaks. Let's see on the example what that means. I will uh, provide some practical examples so it's easier to imagine. So let's assume that in our optimization problem we have two decision variables x1 and x2. Therefore to uh, depict all the objects of this a problem graphically we will need two axes for x1 and x2. Therefore, um, horizontal will be x1, vertical x2. Make it like this. I will go exactly now how we depict some lines, but uh, one depiction which would have these leaps and kinks would look as like this. We have some line, and then it breaks here, and it starts again here. Yes. So to be constraints and objective function linear, they are not allowed to have this, and also they should be represented exactly as a line and not as something like this. First of all, how would I depict some um, solutions of this problem, x1 and x2? As we discussed before, solution is the values of decision variables, which are x1 and x2. So, for example, if we would have solution A uh, with the value 2, 1. Let's do it automatically. So where would it be on my coordinate? So it would be, let's imagine that we have here one, two, three, four, five, 
So it would be two, and here we have one, two, three. So here, one. And we represent this solution with the dot A. In the same way, uh, some other solution, uh, we can also represent it on these coordinates. Also, we would have uh, three decision variables to represent any solution. Uh, we would have to imagine one more axis or, yes, imagine it or we can draw and draw it. And if we would have four decision variables, then uh, it's quite difficult to imagine. But this is only graphical representation. Now, knowing how we can um, uh, represent in graphically specific solutions, let's look at some constraints. So let's assume constraint two x one plus one x five x two is equal to f. Um, this is the equality. So let's now find <coughs> uh, some two solutions uh, that satisfy this equality, right? So. Um, I would suggest to you that uh, that the first solution will be zero and two. It obviously suits, right? So because five multiplied by two is equal to ten, and the next solution it will be. <coughs> I just assume that x two is zero, so x one is five. It's the easiest way to find solutions. Let's uh, name them somehow so we know what we are talking about, solution B and solution C. And let's depict them on this uh, figure that we have. So solution uh, 0, 2, it's here. And solution um, C, 5, 0, it's here. Uh, now, we know that to um, represent any line on the two-dimensional space, it's enough to have two solutions. So, if I will now make a line between these two solutions, B and C, I will make a um, graphical representation, illustration of this uh, constraint. Let's give this constraint number number one. So this is the constraint number one. What does it mean that we have this line that represents this constraint? It means that every point, not only uh, B and C, but every point of, on this line, whatever we take, will be uh, feasible for uh, this equality. And you can try it if you draw it more correctly or precisely, you will see that whatever uh, point on this line you take, it will satisfy uh, this uh, equality. And it happens because of this, uh, it's linear, because it, we can represent it as a line. Now, let's assume what would happen if um, instead of um, equality, it would be um, inequality. So if we would have here less or equal than 10. It means that uh, all the points on the line would satisfy this equality because it's still inequality, uh, it's still equality, but also all the points above or below will also satisfy this um, constraint, this inequality. So, and to check that, let's take one solution. And the easiest is to take Zero, 0, so it's this here, origins of the coordinates. And uh, if we put uh, instead x1, 0, and instead x2, 0, of course, there some will be 0, 0 is smaller than 10. Therefore, for this constraint uh, 1, which is now we imagine this inequality, all the solutions that exactly on the line, plus all the solutions that are below this line, will satisfy this constraint. And the constraint is represented as a line. 
Now uh, some example of nonlinear constraint. And ah, exactly this constraint, if it were an uh, objective function, it would still be linear, yes? You just don't care here this right hand side, just say maximize and minimize, but still it can be represented in your mind. And now some uh, nonlinear constraint, let's think, for example, x1 to the power of 2 plus x2 is less or equal than uh, 4. This is constraint number 2. Which uh, solution satisfy this constraint? So first of all, a, b, c, d. Uh, x1 can be 0. When x1 is 0, x2, we first uh, imagine that it's equality. So then x2 is 2. So then a, b, c, d. Next, we can uh, assume that x2 now is 0. Then, if it were equality, x1, it should be 2. Uh, but we have uh, one more solution when x2 is 0. It's, of course, uh, minus 2. Because if minus 2 to the power of 2, it's still 4. 4 plus 0, it's equal to 4. And now let's depict it on this, um, on our coordinates. So uh, first, this uh, first solution D, it's on 0, 2. So it would be, I will use some other color. It would be here, the exact solution actually D. So it's D, D, D. Uh, then solution E, it's 2, 0, so it's here. And uh, solution F, it's minus 2, 0. So it's E, it's F. Of course, uh, from the school, I hope you know that uh, you would depict then this uh, constraint or this, if it were, equality, not as an equality and not as a line, but as parabola. Which goes like this and which is not linear because it's not, it's like, you see, it's a line which is not uh, really straight. Okay, then where would be our feasible solutions? Because it's not equality, it's less or equal than 4. Let's take something like 0, 0, so it's less than 4. So all the solutions that are inside this figure, they would satisfy the constraint, but this constraint is not linear. So if we would have some problem with such nonlinear constraint, the problem would be uh, nonlinear. And we see it because to represent this constraint as a line, the line wouldn't be straight. And also we see that here is the exponent 2 near the decision variable. So it doesn't satisfy um, this requirement. Now, when we have some uh, understanding, we can just go and simply check which what is here linear and what is not. So, the first uh, problem A, let's check whether we have here some problems. So, uh, this free variable, it just means that this um, continuous variable x, it's not limited from below. So, it can be less than zero, it can be more than zero, therefore, it's free in the value simple space. Before, in the first tutorial, we had example of more equal decision variables, so this is the standard case. But here, x in this problem can take any values, and uh, upper bound for y here is zero. But anyway, here um, you can see there is there are uh, none of the cases that would make this problem nonlinear. Let's go further to the problem B. Uh, so um, we see here that we multiply x1 and x2, and it violates 
of this um, a rule about the products of decision variables. So from that we can already see that this problem is non-linear. In addition, we see here that a uh, variable y it can get one of two variables values minus one and zero, but this doesn't make this uh, problem non-linear. It would make the problem integer, right? Because these are integer variables. So uh, the constraint on the line q this is what makes this problem non-linear, and the uh, constraint or bounds of variable y this is what makes this problem integer. So this problem it's nonlinear mixed integer optimization problem. Uh, now the last problem let's look what we have here. Yes and we see that objective function it's uh, it has exponent 2. It's quite close to what was in the examples here. I mean here it was constrained uh, but still Look similar anyway. The exponent to it makes this decision uh, objective function uh, nonlinear, and therefore the whole problem is nonlinear. The next second exercise for today, and the last related to linear optimization recap, it's called specific cases. In basically, it talks about some specific cases of uh, problem solutions. So here we are asked to solve the problem, which is here. It's very toy example. Uh, it's actually two problems. So we are asked to first find the optimal solution for the first problem. And then for the so second problem, we are asked to solve it as it is. Uh, then to fix x1 to 2, then fix it to some other value and see what we observe. To do that, I will start the. I will not write down this problem from scratch, so I will just start the Excel sheet with the solutions. Here it is, 2a. Uh, so, this is this problem in Excel with parameters, constraints, and so on. Nothing special. I will now go to the solver. I need to add this problem, so we want to maximize the objective function, change variables. There are our decision variables, then constraints. All uh, right, constraints, we have only two constraints. Then all decision variables are positive, so we leave it. Let's use simplex and solve it. Let's see what will happen. And now we get something which says that the objective cell value do not converge. So what does it mean that it doesn't converge? It means that um, one of these decision variables it can be increased infinitely and nothing is limiting it and we never violate constraints by increasing it. So basically it says that we could improve or increase since it's maximization problem our objective function infinitely by increasing one of or both of the decision variables. And such problem is called unbounded. It means that in, for this problem we have any number or infinite number and any not any how limited number of feasible uh, solutions and basically we don't have optimal solutions because there is no such solution that all other solutions are equal or worse than that. Again this is unbounded problem. You can uh, check at home and think why it's unbounded, why some of the decision variables are not uh, limited anyhow. The next case is on the next step. <clears throat> so we are asked to solve it as it is and then <clears throat> to fix x1 to 
one point six and zero. All right, so here is the problem again. I will go to solver. I need again to redefine this. Wasn't saved somehow in the file. So we want to maximize the objective function. Decision variables x1, x2. Constraints. Two inequalities. And of course, it's a linear problem. So, solver found the solution. Great, nothing special happened. Solution is 2 and 0. I will note it here 2 and 0. And then we are asked to fix x1 to this value 1, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, and so on. So, I will put this value into the cell and I want now to fix x1 to this value. So what does it mean to fix the variable? Basically I can add constraint to the model definition which will say that x1 should be equal to 1, 6, 6, 6. Of course then uh, technically it's decision variable but in practice it's then not decision variable, it's a fixed constant value. Anyway, let's go to data solver and add constraint that x1 decision variable x1 is equal to 1.6 and 0. Ah, also we should remember that the value of objective function is 2. It's quite important. Yes. And now when we fixed it, we solve. And okay, and we see that now we have different solution, but the value of objective function it didn't change. So with this solution it's two, and with the solution to zero, let's copy it again, it's also two. So um, it means that we have multiple optimal solutions because uh, they all from the point of view of this problem are the same for us. Because when we talk about the model, the only thing that we want to do is to maximize the objective. And we have several solutions that provide the same objective value. It means that we are indifferent to which to choose. And actually in this case, since it's a linear problem, uh, we have infinite number of uh, optimal solutions because it could be not only two and zero or one sixty six and zero sixty six. Six, six, but many um, solutions in between. Because if you would now depict this decision variable of this decision uh, objective function of this problem as a line, it would look something like that. I, I will not draw it now. And we now found two solutions, but all the other solutions on this line, they would also be uh, optimal because they all are the same. We will not go deeper into this topic, it's just for your understanding and that you have intuitive feeling of optimal solution, integral solution, and, and so on. So, uh, in this exercise, we saw uh, an example of time only problem. We saw an example of problem with multiple optimal solutions. Last time, we discussed uh, the case of infeasible problem. This is a problem which has no feasible solutions at all because whatever we try it always violates the uh, constraints and now we uh, finished with linear optimization recap and now we can go to the uh, deciding under uncertainty and certainty to the decision models the question uh, number three is related to the um, second uh, lecture and it's about not about optimization but about decision theory so according to the decision approach decision theory we are provided the explicit so all the possible choices are provided to 
us explicitly. And uh, if we look at the differences between decision model and optimization models, in optimization models, sometimes we have infinite number of possible solutions, of feasible, infeasible solutions, so of the solutions that we might investigate. Like it was uh, here, it can be 2, 0, 1, 66, 0, 66, but everything also in between, and we need somehow to investigate it. In, in decision models, we are explicitly provided all the possible solutions which we can use, and then it's up to us which of the solutions or basically decisions uh, we should apply. So let's go back to the exercise. And in the exercise, we are given a payoff table with some probabilities. So uh, the um, what is payoff table? It's actually a table which provides us all the possible um, decisions. And here, according to this payoff table, we have four possible decisions, or they are also called alternatives, which are conservative investment. It means that we decide to invest conservatively, speculative, anticyclical, inexperienced investment. And then we are uh, given some states of the future. So it's something what we not sure about, what will happen in the future. And according to this table, we have three situations, three states, it's growing economy, stable economy, and strategic economy. We are also provided here the probability. So we don't know which, uh, what will realize exactly in the future, what will be in the future, but we know the probability. How this probability is calculated is another question. So basically what we are asked here, we are provided um, four alternatives, which are different investment strategies and for every investment strategy we are given the profit which we will get depending on the um, future situation and we are asked to decide which um, investment strategy we would exercise of course uh, we need to make the decision now we cannot wait and sit and wait until some random variable or like some fact will realize some stochastic fact. So we need to make the decision now. And you can now look at this number. Sometimes we have profit, sometimes we have negative profit or cost. And you can uh, think which decision you would make. Of course, often um, you see that, for example, for speculative investment, when we have a growing economy, we can earn a lot. But with the shrinking economy, you can also lose quite a lot. And with conservative investment, your risk will look greater. And the risk, they are not so uh, high because the range between the worst and best case scenario uh, for this strategy, they are not so different. So you can think which path you will choose. And uh, as you might guess, uh, different people would choose different uh, strategies or different decision makers would choose different strategies depending on their um, personal preferences, on their risk attitude, and so on. And uh, so therefore, uh, we are asked to evaluate these alternatives using different criteria. And it's up to you then if you would do it in the real life, which criteria you will use, but we will now review different decision criteria. To describe every uh, criteria, we will uh, use some notation. Let's look at elements of that notation. So this is the abstract representation of the payoff table. And you see that rows in this representation, they are provided as alternatives. So they are defined with A. And we have here on this illustration A1 and A2. So alternative one and alternative two. Of course, we can have any number of these alternatives. And then um, we have some environmental state, states of the future, which will come in the future. They are defined with S1 and S2. And for every uh, pair of alternative and environmental state, we have some outcome or result. In our example, the result is the profit. So it's something 
positive, right? It would be also cost, which is negative. Anyway, a uh, result, R, and then first index is the alternative, second index is the uh, environmental state. Some people, they just remember that the first index is the flow, second index is the form. But you should always uh, remember that this is a theoretical concept. You might be provided with some table that has uh, transpose, which is transpose, so that you have in every row you have alternatives, and in every row you have environmental assets. And now, this is some example about oil. So, uh, there are two types of decision criteria. Uh, first, it's when we don't look at the uncertainty, so we don't care about uncertainty, and we call the such criteria, decision criteria for background. It's like for when we don't know exactly the future. And then when we take into account the probability, and probability we have here, the probability of every environmental state, then we group this um, criteria into the decision criteria for risk. In every group of this criteria, we have several of them. Where is it? Yes, here vagueness, and we have there five criteria and risk three criteria. But before we apply any of this uh, criteria, let's look at the payoff table and think uh, maybe there are there is or there are uh, some alternatives which aren't worth to revise or to include in the analysis so you can compare alternatives between each other look at their outcomes for different situations for different states and try to understand whether maybe some of them makes no sense and uh, yes the one alternative that is completely not useful it's or which outcomes Right. makes no sense to are so bad that it makes no sense to include it it's inexperienced investment so if you compare it with alternative a3 and to certificate investment you will see that for growing economy and stable economy these both alternatives for give us the same yield the same profit but for the shrinking economy anti-cyclical investment is better so in other words uh, anti-cyclical investment is the same as good as A4, and sometimes it's even better. And if you think about it, uh, you will understand that I mean, there can be no any logical criteria which you would apply, which would make sense to prefer A4 over A3. If we look at it more theoretically, we have some terminology in the lecture. It's here. It's so to say the words with which we can use to compare different alternatives. And the first we have the definition of state efficient. So it says that uh, an alternative is state efficient. Let's say that alternative A4 is state efficient if there is no any other alternative, AQ, so from A1 to A3, which fulfills that every outcome of that another alternative is more or equal to that outcome of the, in our case, A4, and that uh, there is at least one state for which outcome of that another alternative is even better. And let's now look at the alternatives and we see that for alternative A4, there is one another alternative, which is A3, for which outcome for every state is the same, or bigger, so here it's the same, and for at least one, so for one uh, state, outcome is even better. So, there is such alternative, it means that alternative A4 doesn't fulfill this definition of state efficient, that means that probably it's state inefficient. Now, the next uh, related definition is the polynomial, and it says that an alternative, some alternative AI, uh, dominates another alternative if for every state the uh, outcome of this AI 
is at least as good as the outcome of another alternative A B. And also you see that non-efficient alternative is dominated by at least one alternative. So let's see that uh, alternative A3 is dominated through four because for every outcome, for every state, its outcome is at least as good as for A4. And uh, A4 is dominated by is dominated by at least one alternative, which is dominated by A3. And now uh, we have also, in addition to dominance, something which is absolute dominance. And this is the case when um, the best case result of alternative AQ is not better than the worst case result of other alternative AI. In our example, we don't have it. Uh, because, so, the worst case for A4, it's, um, uh, for, of A3, it's minus 10. The best case of A4, it's 10. So the best case of um, A4, it's better than the worst case of A3. Yes, yeah, so we don't have um, absolute dominance. And also you can see that a4, it can be excluded from the analysis, even so, um, for a shrinking economy, its outcome is not the worst among all the alternatives. It's just the case that it's dominated by A3. And also, from this definition, you can see that if two alternatives have exactly the same outcome, then they dominate each other. So, if a3 would have outcome for shrinking economy also 10, then outcomes of these two alternatives would be the same. Then according to the definition, each of them would uh, dominate the other. And then um, each of them would be state inefficient and we would have to exclude either of them from the analysis. And now let's finally go to the Uh, criteria. We will start from the, uh, as I said, uh, vagueness and the first uh, criterion is maximum rule. So here is the definition of this maximum rule. Definition will be uh, like we'll have the same structure for every criterion. So the main idea of maximum is to choose the alternative with the highest minimal profit. So even from this description, you don't need any other mathematics. If you just read it, you can understand what you are asking. You, need, you want to choose some alternative with the highest minimal uh, profit. And you see here the stamp, so it's emphasized that we don't care about probability at all in our analysis. For uh, to solve this um, exercise, you are given or provided the uh, Excel worksheet so that, but you can do it on the paper if you want. So here is this worksheet. We have the first step for maximum, and uh, we are asked to find the highest minimal profit. According to this criterion, how do we evaluate every alternative? So U is evaluation of alternative AI, and in our example now we have three alternatives. One we excluded. It is the uh, Evaluation is the minimal uh, outcome for every J, so for every environmental state in the future. Okay, let's look what it is. So for U A I for every uh, alternative, for conservative weighted and anticyclical, it's the smallest outcome. I will, of course, use a formula to find the smallest outcome. The worst case, so to say. All right, this is the worst case now. And now we choose the alternative AI star, so it's the best alternative which has the highest evaluation. So which has the highest UAI, that alternative we choose. From all our alternatives, the best worst case have actually two alternatives, minus 10 
and minus 10. And here you have a note that if something like that happens, you are like in big time. You can choose either of them or, yeah, choose either of them randomly or you can state that we can choose any of them. So we write here what is the best, so what the evaluation of the alternative AI star, so of the best alternative it's minus 10. And what is that best alternative? It's conservative or anti-cyclical. Now, what is that basically? Yes, and the final formula is um, so the uh, evaluation of the A I star, it will be the um, maximum value for the evaluations of all the alternatives. So it's maximum of the i's. i's is the index of the alternative. Um, what basically it means, it means that our decision maker is quite uh, pessimistic. He or she is pessimistic because uh, this person assumes that whatever decision he or she makes, the worst case will, will realize. So even so, we have three uh, scenarios or environmental states. We assume that for every of the alternative, the worst case will happen. We think we have two ways. The logical thing is to take the best worst case. And that's why we um, call it maximum. So we take the maximum of minimal values. The best of the worst cases. So uh, to this criterion and to all the following criteria, I would say several things. That first of all, um, you should remember that in our current exercise, what is provided here, it is the uh, profit. So it's something good. So the more value is, the better it is. If we would have here the cost, cost is something bad. So then the highest value would suddenly be the worst case, right? And then if you would imagine that here we have not profit, but cost, and if you would be asked to evaluate such table using maximum criteria, then you would, uh, your solution would be quite different because for the first conservative alternative, instead of minus 10 as worst case, you would choose 30 because 30 is the worst uh, cost. Then uh, for the second, you would also choose 40, and for the third, you would choose 15. So your uh, calculations from the mathematical point of view, they would be over. So uh, even uh, when you look at this uh, formulas, it always says max, but it would be better to call all these values as uh, best of the worst. And then whether worst and best are uh, maximum values or minimal values, you should look at it according to the situation. And the next, uh, if you are asked to explain this criterion on the exam, please don't say that to calculate it, you find the maximum value of a rows for the uh, minimum value in the columns. Uh, because this is how we represent it here in our examples. In real life or in another situation, you might be provided data in completely another form. So if you are asked about this criterion, just explain it uh, that you choose the worst cases for every scenario and then choose the best out of them and that is your uh, best alternative uh, which you choose. Next is uh, maximax criterion. You see maximin, now maximax, so the logic is the, uh, the same and here you choose the <clears throat> best out of the best. So choose the alternative with the highest profit. For the case of profit or cost, it would be with the lowest. Then uh, we evaluate every criterion now, not by choosing the minimum value, minimal value, but choosing the maximum outcome for of the all the uh, states. And then the same as before, among uh, these evaluations for every alternative, we choose the highest one. So let's just do it on the example. New criteria, new tab, which will be maxi max. 
Now, uh, every alternative is now evaluated according its best outcome, which is 30, 40, 15. And of course, among these best outcomes, we choose again the highest value, the best outcome, it's 40, and it's related to the speculated decision. And you can see that uh, this decision is completely opposite to one which we had in maximum. And this is the decision of a rather optimistic person who assumed that whatever a state comes in the future, the best case for every alternative will happen. Or we will experience the best profit. And therefore, why don't we just choose the alternative with the highest profit? And that's what we do, and it's opposite to what we had before for maximum. The next criterion is the uh, middle uh, between two community. So uh, none of the people in reality are absolute pessimists or optimists, right? Therefore, it would uh, make more sense to have some criterion which um, find middle decision between the worst and best uh, cases, and it would be useful to somehow uh, weigh uh, these outcomes and choose the one which is uh, which suits our pessimisticity or optimisticity. And for that, we use the parameter alpha. So every alternative we evaluate as alpha multiplied by maximum outcome of that alternative and this was what we used in maximax plus one minus alpha multiplied by minimum outcome so we wait and we find the average between a uh, maximum and minimum outcomes and that's why this uh, alpha it's from zero to one because it's something like a uh, percentage if we are half optimistic half pessimistic, then we choose alpha is equal to 0 0.5. If we feel that we are more uh, optimistic, we put 0 0.7 as alpha, and then we will give more weight to the optimistic prognosis, to the maximum value. And you can see here, we don't evaluate any of the um, states which are between. So we take only two marginal uh, states and look at them. Okay, let's do the same. So we create a new tab. Um, and now uh, here we need one parameter, which is alpha. So uh, let's write alpha here. Let's now take alpha, which is equal to 0 0.5. So we are in the middle of pessimisticity and optimisticity. Then we evaluate every uh, criterion according to the formula, which is alpha multiplied by the best outcome for that alternative, which is for conservative will happen under growing state in the future, plus one minus alpha multiplied with the worst case which is minus 10. All right. Now I will fix alpha variable in the formula and drag it just simply down and then check. So the for the second alternative, the best outcome again for the growing economy, and the worst is again for the shrinking. And for anti-cyclical, which is something probably like a crisis investment, the best, ah, it's completely opposite. The best outcome is for shrinking and the worst is for growing. Yes. So it's again, when someone plays short as an investor. Okay. All right, so, and these are our uh, weighted evaluation for every alternative. Then, of course, we again choose the best one, the highest one, 
and the highest one is consuming. Or here I should write M, and here which decision we do is conserve it. And now since uh, in real life something like that would also happen because since we took alpha 0 0.5, it means that we are in the middle. We are not too uh, risky, or we are not too optimistic and not too pessimistic. Risk is not the correct word here. So we would choose something in the middle, and in the middle, as you can see, it's conservative. Even it comes from the name because speculative is probably something where we, yes, we are ready to lose a lot and to earn a lot, and anti-cyclical is completely the opposite when we are very safe. So here we have conservative. Now, uh, alpha it is the measure of of optimistic. So if I will put it to the highest value, to the one. You can check what will happen with the evaluation. It will be 30, 40, 15 for every uh, alternative, for every decision. And now, if I will go to the maximax, it's exactly the same. Why? Because maximax it's a marginal case to the very optimistic person. And when I said alpha to one, it's again the optimistic, uh, the marginal case, maximum value. So it will be equivalent to maximax. And if I will set it, if I set it to zero, it will be maximin, and you can check that the values will be as a maximin. Yes, and then we can choose any uh, anything in between. As I said uh, before, maybe this um, criterion it's more realistic because it somehow assumes that we are not completely optimistic or pessimistic and takes it into account. But the problem with this criterion is that um, it only evaluates, as I said before, the two marginal cases, the best and the worst case. But what what is with the cases in between, the states uh, in between, uh, scenarios in between? Uh, because now we have three states, but if we would have uh, 20 of them, it would be quite weird to take into account only two for every alternative. And therefore, the natural development on, of our uh, criteria, which you might assume, is to take the average. And this is what has named Laplace criteria. So we calculate the unweighted, meaning that we don't would, uh, take into account or don't take it for the probability and mean value of all results. And again, the um, every alternative is evaluated as average unweighted profit or outcome and um, yeah and then we do everything the same so and if we do it in our small example uh, here instead of uh, this we don't need alpha anymore and instead of this we just need to calculate average for every alternative in its outcomes. Yeah, averages look a little bit ugly, so uh, like this. And then again, as always, we will choose the um, average, the highest average, the best average outcome. So it is 6.7, which is alternative speculative. So this is the most balanced probably according to this criterion. Yeah, it somehow mm. is the best one. Even so, from the names, I would assume that the most balanced should be conservative, but who oh know? Speculative. Yes. And now the last. Uh, Criterion under backiness is the minimax regret criteria. Before going through the slide, let's make an example. So we need exactly the same, well, almost the same instruments as we had before. Uh, this all is not valid, 
Uh, now, so minimax regret. What is regret? Let's imagine that you uh, you did some evaluation using this criteria or another, and you decided to take the conservative. So you go the conservative way. Uh, you invest in a conservative way, and then in the future comes the stable economy. So that's what comes to reality. What kind of thoughts you might have? You will think, first of all, oh, it's so nice that you didn't invest into anti-cyclical because then your uh, profit would be zero instead of five million euro, which is a big difference. But then you will regret that you didn't invest in speculative because then under this uh, scale, you would have profit 5,000 more than what you get according to your choice to your decision, right? So that is what we call a regret. A regret is the difference between your uh, current decision and uh, the best outcome for that uh, state in which you find yourself. Now, of course, right now, before we know the future, we cannot say exactly what would be our regret because we need to know our uh, the state which will realize in the future and we don't know which state which will realize but what we can do now we can first it's like first step to calculate regret for every alternative and for every state which will happen in the future here we call it all ij so we'll calculate here regret which is all ij for every alternative, for every decision, and for every state in the future. So let's start using the same, same approach which I said before. As I said before, so uh, for the conservative, if in the future will be the growing economy, you will be happy that you have at least 30, but you will regret that you lost 40, so that you lost actually 10 million, uh, because you would get 10 extra million if you would uh, choose speculative investing. So we can write it down as uh, 40 minus 30. This is our regret for conservative when growing economy. Then what is our regret for stable? It's again the highest value we see it's 10, the highest profit minus 5. Now what is our regret when we have shrinking economy and chose conservative? It will be now equal to quite a lot. 15 minus what we get it's minus 10. So it's 25. Now instead of doing this manually we can apply some formulas. So we calculate the regret and this formula it's written ah, it's written here so for every um, alternative the regret is rj star and RJ star is the best uh, outcome over all alternatives minus RIJ is the current outcome. So uh, R star is equal to the maximum of all the alternatives. So for all the outcomes for the state minus current uh, outcome. So the formula in Excel will look like this. Uh, of course, you just need to understand this formula. It's not the course about the Excel. So, and even if you will be given uh, such exercise on exam, you can calculate these numbers in any way that you want. The only important that they're correct. Um, or maybe you will have to explain something, then you need to uh, provide explanation. 
which formulas to use, not so important. Uh, now, I guess I can then simply copy it. Uh, yes, and if I want to copy it below, I will need to fix the row. Let's put copy it below. So these are the uh, regrets. Let's, for example, this entry cyclical. Why do we have here such a high regret? Because it will take a decision of anti cyclical investment. And if in the future comes growing economy, economy starts to grow, or when we will be very upset because our losses will be minus 10, when we could potentially earn 40 and the difference is 50. So it looks nice. And then and now when we have all the regrets calculated, and I repeat it, we don't know what will be the future, we calculate it nowadays, so it's okay. Our motivation is now to uh, find that alternative which provide us with the lowest worst case regret. Uh, uh, lowest worst case regret that we really must have. So when we analyze evaluate every alternative, we find first the maximum and what means the worst uh, regret, which we might experience for that alternative. So it's the maximum over every row in our example. And uh, we see that, for example, for the conservative alternative, the worst uh, uh, regret would be 25. And for the second, 45, and so forth. Now, of course, regret is something bad. So, uh, we choose as the evaluation of the alternative, or the evaluation of the best alternative, not the highest value, but the smallest value. So, we choose the worst, the smallest regret, which is the best case for us. So, it is 25, and it corresponds to the conservative alternative. Yes, and this were uh, five criteria of Vegas, you see that we have maxi mean, we don't have mini mean, and uh, we don't have mini max criteria because um, they are named with assumptions that we find the highest value for something what is good, and mini max we have, have only when we, uh, so to say, uh, make a decision about regrets, which are something bad. Now we can uh, start with decision criteria for risk, and the main feature of them, the difference is that they, this criteria, take into account the probability. Because if you look at the payoff matrix table for our exercise, uh, you can see that uh, directly comparing outcomes in case of stable scenario and growing economy scenario, it's not this fair because stable economy has probability five times higher than one of a growing economy. So it's like naturally we would like to probably somehow take it into account. The first, first criterion that we look at is the simplest one. It's the maximum likelihood criterion. And the idea behind it is that we evaluate every alternative according to the most probable outcome that this alternative can uh, generate. So for every alternative we choose that outcome with the index J star and J star is the index of the state uh, with the highest uh, probability. That's what this expression says. And then uh, again as before we after we evaluated the alternative we can uh, choose the one with the maximum like value. Uh, now, um, so it will be maximum likelihood. Uh, we need a probability. I will add probability, which was 0 0.1, 0 0.5, Let's keep it neat and Really? 
All right, now um, it's obvious that probability doesn't depend on the alternative. So uh, the, sta uh, the state with the highest probability is the same for every alternative. And we see that in our case, it's stable economy uh, state. So we can just use this. Uh, values for every corresponding uh, alternative as an evaluation of that alternative. And we see that the best with the highest outcome is the al uh, alternative speculative, which has outcome 10 and it's speculative. Uh, again, the problem or disadvantage of this criterion, as you might guess, is that we don't care at all about this uh, other uh, state. And you see that if probability of stable is 50, then probability of other, and you can even calculate it, it's uh, also 50. So we don't care about the half of other possible scenarios that can be realized and can come to and be reality. And to overcome it, we use the next criterion, which is called expected value criterion, or mu criterion, because mu is in statistics, we use it to denote uh, expected value. What is expected value? I hope you uh, know it and studied this several times. So uh, expected value of, or in our case, expected profit of, of alternative AI, we find it as weighted average, of all uh, outcomes, where we weight outcomes by their probability. So, for the case of our example, it will look the best for that to use uh, uh, compound multiply function, but I will do it step by step. So um, we calculate for every real alternative and for every uh, state, we multiply the probability with the expected or not expected outcome. And now we get the expected outcome, say for that state. We add the element for the next state. And for the next state, and then we get the expected profit for that alternative. Now we can calculate the same for other alternatives, and we see that the best for us is alternative number five because it has the highest expected profit, which is five. And therefore, we choose undecided call. Alternative. Uh, here, yes, we evaluated the expected outcome of every alternative. And now we can uh, go to the last criterion for today. Generally, for our tutorial, this is the new uh, sigma criterion, or in simple words, it's uh, expected uh, value and standard deviation criterion. So, standard deviation, I hope you studied in statistics and in other courses several times. So, what's the first of all idea of this uh, criterion? So, uh, before we uh, calculated the previous expected value criterion, we concentrated on mu, which is some um, average. And let's assume that we have alternative one, alternative two, and alternative three. And they all have the exactly the same expected outcome. So uh, they have maybe different. Um, outcomes for every state, but after we calculate the expected outcome, it might happen that they all are the same. 
And then, according to expected value criteria, we would all uh, evaluate them all as the same. But for uh, some decision makers, sometimes it's also important how much, uh, on average, uh, the outcome deviates from this um, mean. So, in which range our outcome can deviate on average? So, it can deviate plus some amount and minus some positive amount. And uh, this deviation, it's called basically uh, sigma or expected uh, deviation. It's always symmetric, but it, it is different for different distributions, or in our case, for different alternatives depending on the uh, outcomes for every scenario. And now, if you uh, would evaluate which uh, alternative you would choose among these ones, well, you it's not such a straightforward decision. Because let's say that our mean is uh, 5. Yes, let's um, add some scale. So let's assume that it, it's some axis. Our profit increases from left to right so here we have five and it is the expected profit of all alternatives then here we have six here we have seven here we have eight here we have four three and two and it means that for alternative one our expected profit that we get is five our average one but it can deviate for different states from three to minus seven, and the uh, then this expected deviation is two plus minus, right? Then uh, alternative two it deviates from four to six, and three deviates from um, two to eight. And the question is, what would you choose? And some uh, person who is rather uh, let's say optimistic, but here it would be more correct to say a risky person or risk-seeking person, this person will assume, all right, if I take alternative three, on average I will get five, but I have chance to get extra three millions. So this example will not look at the exact number. I have a chance to get all this amount as a bonus, and I believe that if I take this risk, it, that's what I will get. Some uh, risk averse person, it will say, all right, you can get this, it's very good, but since deviation is so uh, huge, you might also get uh, three uh, millions less from the mean. So, this something bad would have might happen, right? So, it depends on uh, what, uh, like, how, how do you evaluate how this deviation will work for you. Will it be positive and will it be negative? Or it would be negative. And if you think that it will be always working for you, it will be positive, then of course you will take the alternative, taking into account that they are all expected uh, values are the same. You will take the alternative with the highest deviation. Because you assume that you will win all this part. And of course the person who thinks that deviation will work against your or him, they will take the uh, alternative with the smallest deviation. So this one, alternative two in this example, because only this part will be bad. And it's um, it's much better. Uh, now, if we would have, uh, let's say, uh, alternatives with different deviation and different expected values, Let's say that alternative uh, three, it would have expected value of, well, let's take like this. So it would have expected value of seven and quite a large deviation of two, 
that even if all the deviation works against you, you can get the worst in the worst case, so to say, five. So what would this person who is uh, risk most, who is thinking negative about the deviation, what would it choose? This person would now choose alternative um, three, because even if deviation works against you, the worst profit you can get is five. But with this alternative two, which this person would choose before, when expectation expected uh, profit was the same, it's now uh, the worst case is four. So that's the main idea. It's a little bit from statistics, and now. Uh, we go back uh, to the lecture slide. So, uh, in addition to expected value, which we calculated before, we need to calculate sigma, and also we have this parameter e. And uh, how uh, do we calculate the standard deviation? You see this formula. Uh, so, for every, we calculate it per alternative. So, uh, for every state, we find the deviation or the difference from the expected value of that alternative and the outcome which we get in every state. So we calculate this difference. Then we want to have a standard deviation at the end as the positive net number, as absolute number. So theoretically, we could take from this difference absolute. So find the absolute value, but we don't do it due to some numerical properties which we need. So we just simply um, put it to the power of two. And of course, any number in the power of two, it will be positive, right? And uh, this is difficult to interpret um, what does it mean, this difference in the power of two. But then we, so to say, at the very end, we'll bring all the values back to the normal value because you see here the square root. So this power of two and square root, their main uh, aim is simply to transform positive and sometimes negative uh, numbers to the only positive number, right? And anyways, when we found this difference, we multiply it by uh, probability and find the sum of it, so we just find the expected uh, deviation, which is standard deviation. All right, and then we evaluate every um, alternative as the expected value which is here, this uh, dot, uh, plus Q, which, as I said before, corresponds to whether we are, or explains whether we are risk averse, risk neutral, or risk seeking, and uh, this with the deviation. So what we do, we just take this expected value for the alternative as a basis, and then using Q and deviation, we decide whether we move to the right or to the left. If we have a Q equal to 1, it means that we will move completely to the right. If it's negative, to the left. If it's 0, we will not move anywhere. We will uh, evaluate alternative according to the, its expected value. And then this approach will be completely equivalent to the previous approach or to the previous criteria. And let's now do it in practice. So for the calculations, we need uh, expected value, and we, we had it before. We calculated it before. So I will just move it here. Expected value, uh, and then next step, which we want to do, it's to um, Calculate standard deviation. So let's have a look again at the formula. So we need to find, yes, first the difference to the power of 2, then multiply it with probability and square root. All right, so I will do it manually with this formula. And step by step, I will not use some built in formulas in Excel. So for the straight one, we need to find the difference between expected value, which is the same for all alternatives, for all states of alternative 1. So it's expected value minus outcome of the first state. 
then to the power of 2 um, and then we multiplied with the probability of that state which is here uh, yes then I will subsequently drag it down so I need to fix some of the rows for example for probability I don't want it when I drag it to go down yes and I don't need to fix anything more now we add to this almost the same thing but we change the column so for the second state we work with the column G we don't change the column of the expected value and again column G and now for the last state column H and column H now we found the sum weighted by uh, probability and we want now to go come back from the numbers in the power of 2 to the normal absolute number so we need to find the square root of all the stories like this all right I hope it's correct we'll check then the solution uh, and now I can simply um, make it shorter I don't need so much so much um, numbers after comma decimals after comma and now I can drag it down uh, yes so we calculated standard deviation and now we evaluate every um, alternative for that we need some parameter q which defines how risk works for the second risk factors and where some very risky person so if this parameter is equal to one it means that every alternative we will evaluate in the following way we will take its expected value and add standard deviation multiplied with the parameter so we add some part of the standard deviation because we assume that it will work positively for us and uh, yes so I couldn't I should have fixed this and now I can drag it okay now it looks makes sense uh, yes so that's the evaluation of every alternative when we take all the standard deviation working for us you can see I will so and of course then we choose the highest of these guys and it's speculative so it's 20.7 and it's speculative Uh, now uh, we can try to set it to zero it means that we don't care about risk at all and of course uh, then our evaluation of every alternative is exactly the same as for simple expected value and then we can think that we are scared of any kind of risk so everything will depend on us so we put it to minus one and then um, the best is then anticyclical because it has the highest result or in this case it has the highest losses so uh, this is what the main uh, idea of standard deviation is this criteria which is a modification of uh, expected or average criteria this was it with all the criteria. So we revised uh, criteria of vagueness when we don't care about probability and criteria of um, for risk when we take care or think about the uh, probability. And uh, now we have the last slightly artistic 
subtask is to create a decision tree for the expected value. In other words, what we have here, we want to represent it graphically as a decision tree. So we will use the format uh, as it was the same as in the lecture, uh, this one. And this tree, you can imagine it as a tree, it starts from the square, and square it's the our final alternatives that we choose. Now it's empty room, so we know which we will choose. Now from this square we have for every alternative in a new branch. So we do branching from our decision. And we have three alternatives, that's why we have uh, three branches. Then I will probably remove it. Uh, and then from every branch, we put here circle to notate the start of the states. So now from every branch, we branch the states. According to our problem, every alternative, it has three states. The states are even the same for uh, every alternative and the same as an entity, but it has a different outcome. But it could be some uh, problems where, uh, for example, if we choose anti-cyclical investment, then shrinking economy never happen. And I'm not sure why would it be in this case, because we talk about the world economy and our decision, but in some other case, maybe, uh, uh, maybe um, alternative have different uh, outcomes. If we, for, for example, would choose to which country we want to travel, our traveling plans, maybe different options would exist or outcomes would exist for every country. Here it's not the case. Think that from every alternative branch we will have three state branches. Uniformal, so called uniformal tree. Always branches into three. And uh, now let's add some. Uh, explanations to this tree. So, this every of these branches corresponds to the alternative. We could write here the alternative names or just as I did. And then here we have states which are growing, stable, shrinking. So, growing, stable. Shrinking, growing, stable, shrinking, and again, growing, stable, shrinking. Now, every alternative, uh, every state has some probability. We want also to put here. Of course, in our case, these are all the same states, so they will have the same probabilities, which are 10%, 50%. Forty percent, ten percent, fifty percent, forty percent, and then again, ten percent. And now, um, at the very end, end of the branches, we can call it at least. We will put the outcomes, not weighted outcomes, just simple outcomes as we have them here. It's 35 minus 10. Then for the second alternative, it's 40, 10 minus 30. And for the last alternative, it's minus 10, 0, 10. Zero ten. This is the all the data that we were given. Now near the nodes from which we have branches for states, let's then add the expected value or weighted average uh, for all the states of the alternative. So for alternative A one. The expected value is 1.5, so I put here 1.5. For alternative 2, it's minus 3. 
and for three it's five. Now when we have it of course we can make a decision and we choose alternative three. So this in masterpiece is a decision tree representation for expected value criteria. And this was basically everything about deciding under uncertainty of the reactive uh, equation. I will explain something more complicated. It will be now optimization under uncertainty. Oh, not now, but optimization. So have a nice uh, weekend and see you on the YouTube or on the next tutorial in the video.